first find who you are in Christ, you'll never know what you are to do for Christ. And this is the misconception. We oftentimes first ask, what am I to do? What is my purpose? What is my destiny? But I believe these questions are important, but they shouldn't come first. The first question should be is, who does God say I am? Because if you don't know who God says you are, you'll never know what God wants you to do. You'll never know what you're capable of doing. You'll never know who you're not. How many know that's important? Right? You're not, you're not just, you're not your guilt. You're not your past. Can you say amen? Right? And so it's important to know who God says you are. So we're going to read a text, Hosea, Hosea chapter 6. In the word of God, chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible says this. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. This text, this is the text of our series. And we've been breaking down simple truth. God is speaking through his prophet. This is one of the minor prophets in the scriptures, Hosea. And he is charging the children of Israel, giving them a a reason for their lack of fruit, a reason for their destruction, a reason for their despair, telling them that why you're going to perish is because you lack knowledge. And so we take that simple principle that lacking understanding and lacking knowledge can produce barrenness and unfruitfulness, and we apply that to our lives today, and we utilize that to answer the questions, what is God? God's will for my life. And so it is crucial that every believer understands their authority in Christ Jesus. It is imperative that, listen, it's not just those outside the church, but those inside the church can have an identity crisis. And so we've covered a variety of, of, of questions uh, that speak of identity. We look around the world, no matter what culture, uh, no matter what background, what country people are from, around the world, people are asking similar questions. Why do I exist? What is my purpose? And as I said, you'll never have a strong biblical basis for these answers uh, Without knowing who you are, finding out who you are, not lacking knowledge of your identity of Christ will help you find out your destiny. And so this is, this is foundational. This is very important. The hope of this series is to help you find out your destiny. And so we've established in parts one and two of this series, this is part three, tonight that purpose is it is very singular and every single person in the entire world has the exact same purpose every single human being has the exact same purpose every christian has the exact same purpose and that purpose is to worship and to bring glory to god that is our purpose. We share a unified purpose that we bring glory to God. But given our uniqueness, our individualities, you and I are individuals. We have different skill sets, talents, abilities, uh, weaknesses, personalities, characters, uh, talents. As, as you can see, as they just ministered, uh, I can never write a song like that. And so we have different talents, and there, is, there are different things that's in us that God has birthed in us that are beautiful, and it's a part of his creation. Some of you can draw. Your ability to draw, God has given you that. Can you say amen? Some of you, I, I, I talked to uh, Sister Tracy about her, you know, her schooling future, and she talks about how she enjoys education uh, and how she doesn't mind being in school for 18 years. Uh, and I begin to sweat, uh, and my, uh, my, uh, my armpits begin to poor and you know I, I couldn't do that because she has an ability she enjoys studying and how many know we need doctors we need pilots like brother Raphael I couldn't stand two days in school and so thank God the whole world is not like me 
And so I'm grateful for that. And so we have individuality, different powers. And so what that means is that although our purpose is the same, our destiny, how we glorify God is going to look uniquely different. Right? Some of us will, will glorify God. As I, I've, u- I've used examples before, some will sing, some will give abundantly. Uh, and so we have different skills and we're going to have different destinies. The purpose of this series is to help you find your destiny through finding yourself, who you are in Christ. An analogy I have for this is you think of the automobile industry. Every vehicle, every car on the road, every car being made in manufacturing plants today have the same purpose. And that is to get you from point A to point B. But you know, not every car is the same. Different colors, right? Cars have different colors. Cars have different engines, different speeds. Uh, uh, Some are manual, some are automatic. Uh, It's the exact same way with us. We have the same purpose to glorify God, uh, but we do it in different ways, in different expressions. I mean, no, your Civic in the Porsche is not going to get you there at the same time, right? Different expressions. uh, And so we're all unique individuals, and God has given us uh, the beauty of our individuality uh, for the purpose of finding out our destiny uh, so that we can fulfill our purpose. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, let me get to my, my message because we've talked about a variety of things. Uh, Part one was more of an intro. Part two, we spoke about the importance of not living a life of guilt and shame. The importance, as our sister uh, Gertrude testified, uh, we spoke about in part two that, listen, we're not to carry our shame. uh, As she shared that, you know, here she is living in sin and she makes this decision. But as she dealt with shame, how many know Christ carried that shame for her? And he carried that shame for us. And so in part two, we spoke about the fact that that you, every time you look in the mirror as a Christian, your identity is that you are forgiven. Your identity is that you are a new creation. Your identity is is that you you, you have a new beginning and a new start. Your past doesn't define you. And so that's what we covered in part two. And so today I'm going to talk about another area in life that the Bible defines us. And we're going to read some very interesting identity, as I call it, identity language. So let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to read a large portion of scripture. Uh, Not yet. Get them to turn their Bibles there. Give them some time, Sister Beatrice. Thank you. So one of the key things that makes us healthy Christians is healthy doctrine. Say amen. If you don't have healthy doctrine, you cannot be a healthy Christian. Good doctrine affects how we think and it affects how we live. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. And so how you act, how you behave, how you live is a summation of what you think. And doctrine influences what you think. If you believe God for miracles and you think about miracles, God will move in the air of miracles in your life. But if you think that God stopped doing miracles when the Bible was completed, if you think that there's no more prophecies, if you think that God can no longer speak through dreams, that God can no longer speak and you can no longer hear a still small voice as our brother saying uh, tonight uh, if you think God no longer does that then God won't do that for you and so how you believe and understand God uh, defines how you're going to live out your Christian life and so doctrine is critical doctrine is important Uh, it is very important that we understand uh, doctrine Uh, one of the most controversial subjects in the Christian community and this is going to be my message for tonight is church membership Is being a part of a church required? Is being involved, is it mandatory for a Christian to be involved and to be engaged and to be connected to a church? And these are are important questions. In a time that we live in today where there is the so-called, quote-unquote, online church, These questions and this idea of church membership, how many know it's under attack? Because the convenience that appeals to the flesh, I said the convenience that appeals to the flesh is on the rise. It's on the rise to have church in our bedrooms. It's on the rise to turn on a laptop and a tablet and to have this deception that we're serving people. Friends, you're deceiving yourself. 
It is on the rise and there is this convenience. And so people ask questions like, do I have to go to church? Do I have to be a part of a church to be a Christian? The answer is yes. Do I have to be involved to be in God's will? Do I have to be engaged? The answer is yes. Can you say amen? Do I have to be committed? Uh, do I have to ha build relationships? Uh, do I have to love other people uh, in a Christian community? Uh, the answer is yes. And this is more than just some commandment. This is more than just us trying to build our church and gather people. But this speaks of identity, friends. Because before all these, before, before we gather for all these fancy purposes, uh, and before, you know, church, as church history went by, uh, and there was an establishment of the, you know, the typical church service that we have today, before all these things, God looked at you and he said, listen, when I purchased you with my blood, I'm going to connect you to a body. And this speaks of identity. Now let's read our text. First Corinthians. Um, chapter 12, verse 12 to 27. Follow along in your Bibles. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. So I want you, I want you to understand what that speaks about. When you and I are baptized, we're baptized into the church. When you and I are saved, it says that we've been baptized into one body by one spirit. When you are saved, when the spirit of God, what the Bible, you know, the word that we use in theology is uh, to be regenerated, meaning you are being born again. You are a new creation. When the Spirit of God transforms you and makes you a new creation, um, you are, he is doing that into a new body. You are being made new into a new body. You are being baptized into a new body. And so verse 14, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. Uh, anybody say not just one part. If the foot says I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that make it any less part of the body? If the ear says I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would you hear? And if your whole body were an ear, where would, the, where would you smell? You know, sometimes we don't want the ability to smell in some places. Um, verse, uh, verse 18. But our, you caught that? You see what I did there? You see what I did there? Okay, verse 13. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. Oh, thank God for his wisdom. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem the weakest and the least important are actually the most necessary. The parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen. Verse 24. While the more honorable parts do not require the special care, so God has put the body together such that each, uh, that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. Verse 25, this makes for harmony among the, mem the members. Anybody say harmony? harmony. Among the members. My, wife, my wife's the only one that said it. Okay. Um, and all the members care for each other. That's a good verse right there. Verse 26, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if another part is honored, all the parts are glad. Verse 27, our last verse. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you are a part of it. Leave that verse up there. You want to know who you are? This is telling you who you are. You are a member of a body. You're a member. You're not called to isolation. You're not called to be a Christian on an island. You're not called to do your own thing, but you're called to be a member of a body. This is, I, this is an identity issue. This is not, you know, we're having a conversation at my house the other night as a fellowship around, you know, some of the newer guys. And um, I think it was Brother uh, uh, um, uh, Michael that asked a very powerful question. You know, what are, what are, what are some actual good reasons? He wasn't, he wasn't asking because he's looking for cop-outs. So, but he says, you know, what are some legitimate reasons to skip church and, and, or miss out church? And, I, you know, I begin to explain that, you know, you know, for me and Charity, our first, the first time we missed church was when Aiden was born. He was born on a Sunday. 
And, and, so, and, and so there are obviously legitimate, but that's not the issue. The issue is identity. The issue is, do you want to be here? The issue is, are you connected? The issue is, are you involved? The issue is, are you plugged in? The issue is, do you understand who God is calling you to be? The issue is, are you embracing who God is calling you to be? Or are you fighting and fighting and looking to be isolated? Because if you are, you have an identity crisis. Any Christian that says, I don't have to be a Christian to go to church, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, has an identity crisis. They're wrestling with their identity. Look at that language. All of you together are Christ's body. To isolate yourself from the body is an identity issue. This is a problem. And God wants us to know that, hey, listen, up. I am calling you to unity among the saints. I love that verse. All of us are baptized into one body by the same spirit. When you get saved, you are saved into a family of believers. Pastor used to say all the time, he says, I don't believe people can join churches. I only believe people are born into churches. It is so, it, the Bible doesn't speak about church joining ship. The Bible speaks about being born into churches, as we saw in our verse. And there is such a significant difference with someone who's just shopping around. And thank God for those shoppers who come and love our church. Amen. But there's such a significant difference with someone who's just looking and looking. And this is not to say anything bad because some people have looked and they found us and God's worked in their lives. But listen, how the Bible declares it is that you ought to meet Jesus. And when the Spirit of God, there's something in your heart, you were born into a body. You're born into a body. You're not called to be a bench warmer. You're not called to be a spectator. Uh? You're not called to just do things uh, when it's convenient for you. But you're calling uh, what you are as a member. You're called to embrace uh, the membership of the body of Christ. One of the first signs that we see in authentic, genuine con uh, converts is that they love going to church. It's one of the first signs of real, genuine conversion. Is people love being around the people of God. That there is this genuine love. It's like you're addicted, man. It's like you're a magnet. You can't, listen, the FOMO, introverted, extroverted, doesn't matter what your personality is, the FOMO is eating you apart. If you're at a fellowship, I remember Brother Colin saying a few weeks ago, uh, he's saying, I can't, I can't believe you guys have fellowship without me. I can't believe you guys are fellowship. This is absurd. The FOMO begins to eat you apart. The, the idea that other Christians are lingering and spending time and talking about Jesus, the sweetest of subjects, uh, and, and just beginning to food around food. I mean, we love food. Thank God for food, friends. Right? We love good food, man. And, 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 and so the idea that Christians will do this and they not invite you all, oh, this is blasphemous. There's no love in this church. <laughs> this is horrible. How can they do this to me? And so this is one of the signs of a genuine convert uh, is that, hey, listen, I love God's people. This is not just the service. It's not about what's on the schedule. I just want to be around other like-minded believers. This is a sign of conversion. Uh, and this is not just a sign of conversion. This is proof that when God's spirit regenerates you and makes you a new creation, he is doing that and putting you in a new body. And this is your identity in Christ. Last week, we learned when you look in the mirror, you have all the biblical proof to say, I am forgiven. This week, we learned that when we look in the mirror, we have biblical proof to say, I belong. I am a member. I'm not to isolate myself. I'm not, I'm not called to live in an island. I'm not, the Christian life is not lived on, on by yourself. You know, you know you can't be your own pastor. You know that? You notice that? You know the Bible says iron sharpens iron? You can't, iron can't sharpen itself. You ever see iron sharpening itself? Probably did. Then you woke up. Right? This is the Christian that lives isolated. It's a dream. It's a fantasy. They're not sharp. Why? Because they are not embracing their identity in Christ. Identity. This is who you are. You are a member of a body the opposite is true 
When someone comes to church and they, and they, and they have an issue, man, and they wrestle. You know what? I could be, start to question that. Is this person saved? Why is it such a fight to get you in church? Why is it such a fight to get, you, to, to get you to build relationships with other Christians? Why is it such a battle? Because maybe you're not saved. You know, sometimes it's harder to unlearn things than it is to learn things. What is instilled in us from, you know, a religious background, what we've learned in the past, most of us, especially me, throughout my, my life, religious experiences, we've always heard, oh, it's okay, you don't have to share your life. I grew up seeing Christians uh, that would go to church, and, 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 and I've never seen a, a Christian from their church in our house, not once, for many years. Many years, uh, I've, I, I've never, I've rarely seen them go to other people's houses or them linking up, if you may, excuse my slang, uh, linking up with other people from their churches, no sharing of life with other believers. And this is okay in most places and most churches. And so this gets inside of us. And so when we come to a church where we are embracing membership, relationship, and love for one another, we begin to fight because we're going through an unlearning curve. We have to unlearn oftentimes in life before we can begin to learn. And this becomes difficult. How many know, how many of you know blood gives life, Right? Blood gives life. You drain all your blood, you're going to lose life, right? Oftentimes, when people get shot, it's not the bullet that kills them. It's maybe if they're, if it's, they're hitting a vital organ, they die. Brain to heart, they die. But if they're not, if it's just a flesh wound, what happens is if they, they can bleed out to death. And so blood gives life, and a, a loss of blood would kill, right? And so... Doctors and surgeons will tell you that once an organ or a limb loses a certain amount of blood, it begins to die. Now think about this, Acts 20, verse 28. It says, keep watch over yourselves and over the flock of God, over the flock of which he, all the flock of which he, the Holy Spirit, has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. For you to disengage or not affiliate with the church, with the flock, this is self-harm. This brings damage to your own identity. You have an identity crisis. And what can happen if you as a member if envision yourself as a hand? If we chop off your hand from your body, what's going to happen to your hand? It's going to die. Lack of blood. This is what happens when you isolate yourself from the body. You die. The blood is in the body. Put that verse back up. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. So we think about salvation. All that Jesus did on the cross, he it, it, it's, it, is, it is manifested, it is at work on the lives of those who are saved. Can you say amen? Now, it's available for the whole world, but it is manifested, it is at work in the church. Because that is where those who are saved are. So any Christian in the church that has an opinion that is contrary to membership or belonging or being a member, they are dealing with an identity crisis. The Bible says you are members of one another. For you to say contrary and say, no, 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 I can have church at home. I can do Christianity alone. That is an identity issue. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, you were a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Leave that verse up there. The Greek words called you out or called out are combined 
to form the word ecclesia. This is where we get the church, the word church from, or it speaks of an assembly or a gathering. So think about this. The Bible was saying you are, this is who you are. Again, identity language. You're not, listen, it doesn't say that you are Mr. or Mrs. Superhero Christian. You can do it on your own. It says you are a chosen race. You are a holy nation. You are a people. Notice it doesn't say you're just a person. You can do it on your own. You got this, Johnny. You got this, Bobby. You got this, Lindsay. No, it says you are a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Called out. This is where we get the word church from. It speaks of an assembly. It speaks of a gathering. So this is very, very, very important that we understand this. Because as we move forward, there is a temptation to find a destiny. Or, you know, we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit on Sunday mornings. And, you know, how many know God... I don't, know, I don't know if you have this conviction as an individual, but every person in the church, outside the church, that have tremendous skills, abilities, talents, they're get, they, they got that from God. I don't know if you knew that. Um, early 2000s, one of the biggest um, uh, groups was Destiny's Childs. I don't know if you knew this, but they began singing in church. And so eventually the devil came with a contract. I mean, you know, money's appealing. So anyways, we have Sasha Fears here marrying the devil himself, uh, Jay-Z. Um, and so, but before all of that, before the Hollywood, before the worldliness, they, their voice, their gifting, their ability was being used in the house of God. And I believe that could have been their destiny, that they could have used their, what God has instilled in them to sing and to glorify God in powerful ways. But there is this temptation to take a gift and isolate oneself from the body. And I believe this temptation comes about. This temptation comes through because people don't understand. That, the, that Hebrews 10.25 that commands us to go to church, it says, Do not forsake the gathering of one another. It, it's a command. It is a direct command. But it's beyond that. It is an identity issue, friends, that this is who we are. We're called to be assembled. We're called to connect. We're called to serve and to love one another. We're not just called to do our own thing. So he's called you out, and he's brought you into his home. He's brought you into his purpose, into his will, into the family of God. And so you have, to, you have to make a decision from this day forward. I want to challenge some people here. You got to make a decision. What are you going to do? Are you going to allow what God says about you to influence your schedule? Because if, we, if you're reading this the way I am, the Bible has a lot of identity language. And it is clearly, clearly saying and defining you and I as members of one another. Members of the same body. And if our schedule, if our children's curricular, extracurricular activities, if our family members' baby shower or birthday parties or our jobs or our school, if any of these things come against our commitment to one another then we're wrestling with identity because God says this is what you are. But when we don't embrace that and we don't, if we don't filter our lives around our church schedule and around the people of God, we're not embracing identity. And this is my challenge for you tonight as I close. My challenge for you tonight, embrace identity. God says this is what you are. When you go home in the mirror, Remind yourself, say, I am a member because this is what the Bible says I am. Remind yourself every time the, uh, uh, you're in an interview and they tell you, hey, you got to work Sunday mornings. Remind yourself, I am a member. 
How can I fulfill God's destiny for my life if, if I don't even know who I am? If I can't say no to the temptations of hell in the world, how can, I, how can I ever do anything for God? If I can't begin to embrace my identity, when someone begins to call you out and, hey, come here, we're doing this and we're, we're doing that, you have to remind yourself, I, I, I didn't just get saved and God didn't just put me on an island. But God saved me. And, and listen, I am a member. I belong to something bigger than just me. I belong to something that God thought to himself, hmm, this is worth shedding my blood for. And you have to look in the mirror. And you have to remind yourself, I belong to this. I'm a part of this. I, I, I'm, I'm not just, I, I can't just keep doing my own thing. Some of you, you have to make some decisions. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to fellowship till 4 a.m. every day right now. You know, you don't have jobs. You know, you're living, you know, you're living a new convert life, you know. Vagabonds and, you know, men's home and it's pastor's house. And, you know, praise God, you're enjoying it. But what about when you, you know, when you go back to school in September? What about when school comes back and the pressures of life and, your, you know, your teacher is calling you? Your teacher is emailing you, hey, you got to send in this assignment. What about when your boss tells you, hey, you have to work on Wednesday nights? Will you look in the mirror and say, I'm a member? I belong to something bigger than myself. Or will you give in and begin wrestling with your own identity? Wrestling with what God has already declared you to, declared you to be. You are a holy nation. God's own special people. Yeah, some of you, you have decisions to make. It's easy right now. No job, we're just chilling, we're hanging out. But what about when you, know, when you have to balance life? And real things come. And you're balancing, and you're balancing, and you're balancing. What decisions will you make? Will you embrace what God's called you to be? Or will you struggle with your identity? Let me get every head bowed, every eye closed.